open your Bibles to the book of Acts, Acts chapter 18. Acts 18 is where we're going to be today as we continue our series uh, going through the book of Acts, our fifth summer in the book of Acts, and uh, another great story of how God uh, has equipped people to go out into the world to share his gospel, his good news of Jesus Christ. Acts chapter 18. If you don't personally own a Bible, we do have paperback Bibles in the chairs in front of you. Any of those are free for you to take and use, uh, pass on to others. Uh, We would love God's Word to be in everyone's hands. And so please make use of those, or you can fire up your app today. However you want to get there, get to Acts chapter 18. College football has been around for a very, very long time. Uh, About a century ago, Uh, There was a game that took place between uh, Notre Dame, the Fighting Irish, and the USC Trojans. It was taking place at Notre Dame, and uh, USC was coming in, a superior team. Uh, They were undefeated on the season. Uh, Everyone uh, thought that USC was going to win and win easily. But the Fighting Irish coach, uh, Newt Rockney was his name, Uh, He devised a strategy. Remember, this was almost 100 years ago, and and some of the rules that they have today weren't in place then. And so what he did, he went out into their city, and he found 100 of the biggest, strongest, meanest-looking men he could find. These guys were 300 pounds, 6 foot 5. He dressed them up in uniform and paraded them out in front of the team onto the field at the start of the game. Now, not one of these men ended up playing in the game itself. But for the entire game, they stood on the sidelines cheering on the Fighting Irish. And from the moment they walked onto the field, you saw USC kind of slump down. They were intimidated. What they knew, that they were the better team, that they should win, did not measure up with what they saw, by what they felt. And that intimidation stuck with them the entire game, and they ended up losing the game. Intimidation. Have you ever been intimidated like that? Not on the football field, but intimidated by what you see, by what you feel, even though intellectually you know that that's not true, that you don't need to be intimidated, that you can have confidence, but what you see and what you feel overwhelms what you know to be true. Today, we come to a story where the Apostle Paul was intimidated. Now, I don't know about you, but that that seems like an odd statement to make. The Apostle Paul, the guy who planted churches all over, the guy who was regularly beaten and imprisoned and, and, and faced riots and all of these kinds of things, things we've already seen so far this summer, you're telling me that he was intimidated by something? Yes, he was. He was facing a test as he came to the next city on his missionary journey, the city of Corinth. Paul's about to face one of the most intimidating tests that he had faced to this point. And Paul's able to overcome and succeed in the face of the opposition that he is facing. And what Paul finds out is what we need to hear today. And it's that God's provision is sufficient for his mission. Paul was given a mission. Take the gospel to the world. And God's provision was sufficient for that mission. Because ultimately it is God's mission. And and God is going to provide for those who are on God's mission. So let's see how that plays out in our story today from Acts chapter 18. Will you pray with me as we get into the word today? God, we thank you. Thank you, Lord, for your word, for these examples we have of your people living in obedience to you, on mission for you. May we learn today from the example of the Apostle Paul, from how you provided and cared for him. May we be emboldened and given great courage to also speak of you, to fulfill the mission that you have given to each one of us. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Last week we saw the Apostle Paul in Athens Uh, Athens, uh, an intellectual center, a center of philosophy and learning. And from Athens, he moves on to Corinth, a a city that some have estimated to be 20 times the size of Athens. It was the third largest city in the Roman Empire at the time, only behind Rome and Alexandria. Corinth was a massive city, a city with great pride and prestige. It was a city that had been destroyed earlier, but was rebuilt by Julius Caesar himself. 
It was the site of uh, a biannual Olympic-type uh, sporting event that was w- world-renowned at the time. It was also a city of great immorality. The goddess Aphrodite had her temple in the city of Corinth. In fact, it was on a, on a cliff above the city, about 2,000 feet above the city. And at night, a 1,000-plus temple prostitutes would come down into the city looking for worshipers. It was a city that was prideful. It was a city that was immoral. It was a city that was very intimidating to Paul. Think about it. Going from Athens, a place of learning, to Corinth, a party city, an immoral city. It would be like going from Cambridge to Las Vegas in today's world. And as he comes in, as you already heard, was read in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 3, Paul says this, as he writes later to the church in Corinth, I came to you in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. Paul was intimidated. Corinth, to Paul, was the equivalent of the 100, 6 foot 5, 300 pound cheerleaders that the Fighting Irish had when they played USC. But Paul did not face this challenge alone. God was with him. God would provide for him. God's provision was sufficient for this mission, the mission of reaching Corinth. And that's what we're going to see as we get in the passage today. Let's read uh, the first five verses of Acts chapter 18. It says this, After this, he left Athens and went to Corinth, where he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had ordered all the Jews to leave Rome. Paul came to them, and since they were of the same occupation, tent makers by trade, he stayed with them and worked. He reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and tried to persuade both Jews and Greeks. When Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia... Paul devoted himself to the preaching of the word and testified to the Jews that Jesus is the Messiah. The first thing we see is that God provides support for his mission. He provides support for his mission. Right away, we see God meeting Paul's need. What is it that Paul needed? Well, think about it. He leaves Athens. He comes to Corinth. Most likely, the the largest and most immoral city that he had uh, gone to on his missionary journeys and and had ministered to up to this point. He doesn't know anybody. He had left his companions behind. What would you do if you came into a brand new city, an intimidating city? Where would you go? Paul looks for work. He is a tent maker by trade. A tent maker uh, making tents, but more than that, most tents at that time were made out of leather. And so most likely, uh, Paul was a leather worker. Making tents, yes, but it's a broader term, meaning to, uh, to work with leather. And so he goes and looks for others who work with leather. And he finds Aquila and Priscilla, Jews in Corinth. But not just any Jewish couple. These Jews had been driven out of Rome. Now, what we know about uh, Claudius driving the Jews out of Rome is this, that there was a conflict that came about in the Jewish community in Rome, and the the conflict was so intense that the emperor, Claudius, said, I'm done with this, and made all the Jews leave. A historical account written decades later references that the the point of, of conflict in the Jewish community was a troublemaker by the name of Christos. Most likely, since it was written decades later, a mispronunciation of the name Christos, Christ. Is it any wonder that the Jewish community was in turmoil and conflict over the person of Jesus Christ? Just like we've seen in every story so far, the Jews had a hard time accepting Jesus Christ as the Messiah. And this takes place with the Jews in Rome. And because of this conflict, they're driven out. What's also interesting about this couple is that there is no uh, reference to their conversion by Paul. Most believe then that these were actually Jewish Christians 
that they were involved potentially in this conflict that made the Jews get expelled from Rome, and these Jewish Christians come to Corinth, and they just so happen to meet Paul, another Jewish Christian, another leather worker who had recently come to town. Do you see how God is providing for Paul? Providing companionship, providing work, providing support by like-minded individuals. Those who will join forces with Paul, not just in the leather trade, but as we're going to see next week in the mission of taking the gospel to the nations. Let me ask you, as you think about the mission that God has sent you on, what is it that you are feeling you are lacking? What is it that you need to look to God to supply? But God's not done providing what Paul needs. He now has companionship and support and and income and work. But look at verse 5. It says this, When Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia, Paul devoted himself to the preaching of the word and testified to the Jews that Jesus is the Messiah. Paul receives more support. Support in, in two areas. First, Silas and Timothy bring good news, a positive report from the churches that Paul had planted and had to leave. You remember that Paul was in Thessalonica and a riot broke out and Paul had to leave. I'm sure it was a burden to Paul to wonder what's going on with these churches that I've left behind in places like Philippi and Thessalonica and Berea. Well, we know that it was of great concern to him because in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, again, Paul is writing a letter to the church that he had planted. And this is what he says. For this reason, when I could stand it no longer, I also sent him, that is Timothy, to find out about your faith, fearing that the tempter had tempted you and that our labor might be for nothing. But now Timothy has come to us from you and brought good news about your faith and love. He reported that you always have good memories of us and that you long to see us as we also long to see you. Therefore, brothers and sisters, in all our distress and affliction, we are encouraged about you through your faith. Paul needed this encouragement, and God provided it through Timothy and Silas arriving when they did. But it seems that it wasn't just encouragement that they brought. They also provide financial assistance. Because notice it says in verse 5 specifically that after they arrive, he devoted himself to teaching about Jesus. He devoted himself, which is a little different than in verse 4 when it says that on the Sabbath day, he would go into the synagogue and teach. What's the difference? Well, he would work during the week as a tent maker, as a leather worker, And then on the Sabbath, he would go and teach. Once Silas and Timothy arrive, he is able to give himself fully to the mission of teaching about Christ. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, we're told why. Verse 9, when I was present with you and in need, I did not burden anyone since the brothers who came from Macedonia, Silas and Timothy, supplied my needs. I have kept myself and will keep myself from burdening you in any way. So a gift was collected from the churches that he had left behind. Silas and Timothy brings this financial gift and is able to then fund the ministry that Paul has to reaching Corinth with the good news of the gospel. See, God provides support for his mission. The support of like-minded fellow Christians, Aquila and Priscilla. The encouragement that Paul's efforts were not in vain in the churches that he left behind, brought by Silas and Timothy. Financial support brought by Silas and Timothy. Again, I ask you, as you think about the mission given to you, what is it that you feel you lack? How do you need to be supported by the Lord? And are you trusting him to supply what you need, even as Paul did? For we are called to the same mission. Matthew 28, 19. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. We are called to take the good news of the gospel to the world. Whether that is in your neighborhoods, in your workplaces, in your schools, in in the gym you, you go to each week. Whatever it is, we are called to take the gospel to whoever it is that we have been sent to. Whether here or abroad. 
What is it that you feel you lack? Is it knowledge? Do you feel like you don't know enough to share the good news of Jesus with those around you? Is it personality? Do you feel like you don't have an outgoing enough personality to be able to share Jesus with those around you? Maybe you feel you lack the opportunity to do so. Maybe you don't know many non-Christians. Maybe you feel you don't have time to do so. What about confidence? I I could go on and on. What is it that you feel you lack? What is it that you need to look to the Lord to provide? Because God's provision is sufficient for his mission. And if you have been sent, that he will provide. He will provide the support you need for the mission that he has called you to, just as he did for Paul. Next, we see God provides salvation by his message. Let's go back to verse 4 and read through verse 8. It says this, He reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and tried to persuade both Jews and Greeks. When Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia, Paul devoted himself to the preaching of the word and testified to the Jews that Jesus is the Messiah. Let's stop there, and then we'll get the next verses in just a minute. Paul goes right back to his pattern of going to the synagogue and teaching. And as I said, first it was on the Sabbath day as he had uh, the time during a normal work week, and then later he was able to devote his entire focus to that ministry. And and what is it that, that Paul teaches? He teaches the scriptures. He teaches the word of God. And from the word of God, from at this point, what we would call the Old Testament, he preaches Jesus Christ and him crucified. That is what he taught. Paul abided by the, uh, the KISS principle, K-I-S-S, keep it simple, stupid, right? Paul kept it simple. He preached Christ and him crucified. That's what we read earlier in 1 Corinthians 2, 1. When I came to you, brothers and sisters, announcing the mystery of God to you, I did not come with brilliance of speech or wisdom. I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Paul realized that is what people need. And that is what Paul was going to give them. I think oftentimes when we think about sharing our faith with other people, when we think about talking to non-Christians about what it means to be a Christian and what we believe, we overthink it, we complicate it. Sometimes uh, under the banner of evangelism, we we get sidetracked by other issues, issues that, that don't direct people to Jesus, but instead pull people away. We think we need to change their view of morality. And so we argue with them on whether or not abortion should be legal or same-sex marriage should be legal or which political agenda is uh, best or why they should not smoke pot anymore or why NFL players should be standing or not standing for the anthem. Or I could go on and on and on with all kinds of things that we end up talking to non-Christians about other than Jesus. We do this also with very legitimate, important things, such as how old is the earth? Was Noah's flood a real historical event? Can you defend the inerrancy of Scripture? All of those are very important things, but none of those things are Jesus. And what is it that people need most? Jesus. And all of these other really important things and really good things we often emphasize more than Jesus when talking to those who don't know Jesus. Let me ask you, will those things lead people to Jesus or away from Jesus? We need to be directing people to Jesus. And that's what Paul said, I I devoted myself to what? To preaching Jesus Christ and him crucified. Paul kept his focus laser-locked on Christ and what he has done for us. The good news, the gospel, that's what gospel means is good news. That though we have rebelled against God, we have ignored God, we have rejected God, the God who created and owns everything, we rebelled against him. We have sinned. We have done wrong. And because of that, we deserve death. And yet instead of coming and judging us, and coming, and exercising the judgment we deserve, and putting us to death, God came in the person, Jesus Christ. And rather than judging the world, he died for the sins of the world. 
He took your sin, every sin that you have done, every sin that you will do in the rest of your life, he took it upon his shoulders along with the sin of the entire world and died in your place on the cross, paying the debt that you could not pay, receiving the penalty that you deserve and that I deserve, but then rising from the grave, showing and proving that his death was enough, that he has beaten sin and death, and he offers to us a new life and the hope of a future resurrection and a relationship with our creator that we were always designed for and that you and I, whether we're conscious of it or not, long for. That is the good news of Jesus Christ. That is Jesus Christ and him crucified. And that is what Paul continued to speak. If you are someone here who is not a Christian and you are interested in what this means for you and what it means to follow Jesus and receive this forgiveness for your sin, I would encourage you to find one of our prayer team. They'll be walking around with orange lanyards around their neck. Find one of us pastors. We would love to talk with you about what it means to follow Jesus, to have a relationship with him. That is our greatest desire, is to see everyone here in a relationship with Jesus Christ. But what was the result of preaching Christ and him crucified? Verse six. When they, that is the Jews, resisted and blasphemed, he shook his clothes out and told them, your blood is on your own heads. I am innocent. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. And so he left there and went to the house of a man named Titus Justice, a worshiper of God, whose house was next door to the synagogue. Crispus, the leader of the synagogue, believed in the Lord along with his whole household. And many of the Corinthians, when they heard, believed and were baptized. What's the result of his teaching? Once again, we see the Jewish people reject their Messiah, reject Jesus. And this time it is especially egregious. Paul is put up with this, but this time he says, I am done. And he moves his ministry next door into a Gentile, a non-Jew's home. Why did he do that? Well, it says in my translation that they resisted and blasphemed. Some of your translations might read reviled, insulted, or opposed, but blaspheme is a very good trans, uh, translation. It's actually a transliteration of the Greek word that is found here. And what it means specifically is to purposefully defame or harm someone's reputation. They were purposely trying to harm and defame the reputation of Jesus Christ the Messiah. And whatever they said, whatever they did was egregious enough that it says Paul shook his clothes out. It, it would be like we would say today, I'm washing my hands of this. I'm done. And he moves his ministry next door. But notice, it doesn't stop with him leaving the synagogue. If it did, what a failure. But verse 8 tells us that God was not done. Paul may have been done with the Jews at that moment, but God was not done with the Jews. Because in verse 8 it says that after he moves his ministry out of the synagogue, the leader of the synagogue and his entire family come to faith in Jesus Christ. See, God is the one who provides salvation. Oftentimes we think that the burden rests completely on us, but we are just faithful messengers sent out to proclaim Jesus and him crucified. But it's God who is the one who saves. And we don't know God's timetable. We don't know what God is doing behind the scenes. Even in the midst of the Jews blaspheming the name of Jesus, defaming Jesus, and Paul leaving, even in the midst of that, God was using it to help the leader of the synagogue and his entire family accept Christ. And then many Corinthians heard, believed, and were baptized. We need to trust that as we go out and are faithful to the mission, that God is the one at work saving people. There was a story I recently read. It took place in the uh, 1940s uh, and early 50s, right after uh, World War II. There was a group of, uh, of young men um, who were studying to enter ministry at Wheaton College. 
And uh, they were uh, there at Wheaton, and they end up meeting this janitor. He was a, a German who had immigrated from Germany right after the war. And he did not speak any English. He only spoke German. And so the, this group of, uh, of young men had a heart for this man, but realized they couldn't share uh, the gospel with him because they didn't speak German. And so instead, they got together on a regular basis and prayed for this German janitor. A few years later, the janitor moved on to another job, and they kind of lost track of him, and, and, and really, over time, forgot all about it. Thirty years later, one of the men who had been in that prayer group was now a, a, an influential uh, a figure, leader in the missions community, entrusted with leading missions endeavors all over the world. And he was at a leadership summit of different ministries and missions organizations and interacting with other leaders from other countries. And during one of the breaks, he went for a walk with the, the head of the Billy Graham Association that was, take, that was working in Germany. And they're sharing stories and they're walking along and they're talking about their history. And this head of the Billy Graham Association in Germany mentioned that when he was a young man, he had immigrated right after the war to the United States. And this man thought, that's an odd coincidence, and asked him, did you ever work at Wheaton College? And the man said, well, yes, I did. I was a janitor. And this man said, did you know Jesus Christ is your savior when you were a janitor there? And he said, no, I didn't know Jesus at all. But a couple years after I left that job and went to a, camp, a YMCA camp, heard the gospel and accepted Christ. And the man said, did you know that there was a group of us that were praying for you to accept Christ? 30 years later, happened to meet up at a ministry summit in Bermuda. We never know what God is doing. Behind the scenes, we just need to be faithful to what he has called us to. To share Jesus however we can. Even if it's just to pray for someone because we don't understand their language and therefore can't share ourselves. Who knows what God is doing to save the world through the gospel of Jesus Christ. See, the gospel has power. God is a God who saves. We must never give up no matter the response. Paul was done, and he left. And what happened after that? The Jewish synagogue leader accepts Christ and his entire family. You never know what God is doing behind the scenes. We just need to faithfully proclaim God's word and trust that it will do the work. That's what we're told in Isaiah chapter 55, verse 10, where it says, For just as rain and snow fall from heaven and do not return there without saturating the earth and making it germinate and sprout and providing seed to sow and food to eat, so my word that comes from my mouth will not return to me empty, but it will accomplish what I please and will prosper in what I send it to do. When we speak the word of God, when we proclaim the gospel, it will fulfill its purpose. God has promised it will do so. Even if we don't see the result, we need to trust that God is the one who saves. He's the one that provides salvation through his message, the good news of Jesus. That's why Paul says in Romans chapter 1, verse 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew and to the Greek. It's the power of God. And so we preach, we proclaim, we present Jesus and the good news of the gospel. And we trust that through that, God will save people. God's provision is sufficient for his mission. God provides support for his mission. He provides salvation through his message. Next, we see that God provides success through his messengers. God provides success through his messengers. Look at verse 9. After many Corinthians were saved and the head of the synagogue was saved, it says this, verse 9, The Lord said to Paul in a night vision, Don't be afraid. But keep on speaking, and don't be silent, for I am with you, 
and no one will lay a hand on you to hurt you, because I have many people in this city. He stayed there a year and a half, teaching the word of God among them. God provides success through his messengers. Paul was a messenger. He was sent with the message of Jesus Christ. And Paul saw success. But notice, even after some success, Paul was nearing burnout. How do we know this? Because the Lord Jesus Christ had to appear to him in a vision to encourage him and tell him to keep on preaching the gospel. Think about Paul at this moment. All that he had been through. He was tired. He was worn out. And even in the midst of God doing a great work, he was discouraged. Have you ever been there? But notice what God does. Jesus Christ shows up in a vision. It's the second time Paul's received a vision of Jesus Christ, the risen Savior. The first at his conversion, and now here to tell him to keep on preaching. And there were two things that Jesus says to Paul in this vision to encourage him to keep preaching. The first is an assurance of protection. What does he say? Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. That, that is a, a refrain in the Old Testament. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. And now saying to Paul, don't be afraid. Why? For I am with you, and no one will lay a hand on you to hurt you. The man who in Philippi had been beaten and imprisoned faced a riot in Thessalonica, faced another riot in Berea. Do you think now, as he once again is facing opposition from the Jews, do you think this was encouraging to him? Keep on preaching, for no one here will lay a hand on you to hurt you. He doesn't say that opposition won't come. He says the opposition will not be successful. You will be protected. The second thing that he has promised is success. He says, Jesus says, I have many people in this city. He's not saying that there are many Christians in this city. What Jesus is saying is that there are many people that belong to him who need to hear the message in order to become Christians. Keep on preaching. Why? I already have many people in this city who are waiting to hear the message so they can respond. Do you realize that, that God has many people in our world just waiting to hear the message because God has ordained that the means of being saved is hearing the message of Jesus Christ? There are many people in our city who belong to him who need to hear the message so they can be saved. It's what we're told in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4. For he chose us in him before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless in love before him. He predestined us to be adopted as sons through Jesus Christ for himself according to the good pleasure of his will. Do you see what that is saying? Before anything was created, God already had chosen people to be saved. Before sin ever entered the world, God had chosen people to be saved. Those people are chosen. They will respond. We are not responsible to make them respond. We're responsible to share the gospel with them. And we are guaranteed success because those who belong to God will respond. It is a promise. It is a guarantee. There are many people, Paul, in this city. So go and preach because they belong to me and they need to hear the message. There are many people here in Dallas. There are many people here in Polk County. There are many people around this world who belong to God, who need to hear the message of Jesus Christ so they can be saved because they belong to him. Do you believe that? So why do we fear? Why do we lack confidence? Why are we intimidated? Those who are meant to respond will. And it's a guarantee. It is a promise. God will achieve success 
will provide success through his messengers, you and me, sent out into the world to preach the gospel. But there's a second, like a point five to this point. And it's that God provides success through his messengers and through his minions. I don't mean the little yellow things in the cartoon. I mean those who serve someone whether they realize it or not. Notice the promise given to Paul. You will not be harmed. And look how God fulfills that promise. Verse 12. While Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews made a united attack against Paul and brought him to the tribunal. This man, they said, is persuading people to worship God in ways contrary to the law. As Paul was about to open his mouth, Gallio said to the Jews, if it were a matter of wrongdoing or a serious crime, it would be reasonable for me to put up with you Jews. But if these are questions about words, names, and your own law, see to it yourself. I refuse to be a judge of such things. And so he drove them from the tribunal. And they all see Sosthenes, the leader of the synagogue, and beat him in front of the tribunal. And none of these things mattered to Gallio. An attack is leveled against Paul, but he is protected. How is he protected? Not by an angelic army, not by other Christians, but by a secular judge, a secular ruler. And not only does this protect Paul, but it has implications that would last over a decade. You see, he is the proconsul of Achaia, not just of Corinth. It's kind of like here in Dallas, we have the seat of Polk County, and we have the county courthouse. But this is on a much bigger scale. See, what's decided here affects all of Polk County. What's decided at Corinth affects the entire region of Achaia, a massive region. And what the Jews were trying to do is this. See, the Jewish religion, the Jewish faith was protected under law by the Romans. They were a recognized, legitimate religion. Up to this point, Christianity was a, a, looked at as a, a sect within Judaism. Thus, it was also protected because it was part of the Jewish faith that was already recognized. The Jews are trying to say Christianity is not Jewish. It's separate. It's different. It should be viewed as an illegal religion and thus not protected under law. They were trying to get it to become illegal to be a Christian. What does Gallio decide? not hearing it. You're out of here. Why? Because he thought it was a good idea? No. Because God was working his will through Gallio. And for the next decade or so until Nero comes along, Christianity is protected in this area and was allowed to flourish, allowing these churches to become established. And we were able to weather the storm of the persecution under Nero. See, God is working through his minions. That is, anyone and everyone doing God's bidding, whether they realize it or not. God is sovereign over all things, even secular judges. Let's go back where we started. Was Paul intimidated by his mission? Yes, very much so. But did Paul succeed? Yes, because God's provision was sufficient for the mission that Paul was sent on. God provided for him. You and I have the same mission. Are you intimidated by that mission? Will God provide what you need to accomplish that mission? Are you a mom or a dad or maybe a grandma or grandpa and the mission given to you by God is to raise your children, your grandchildren, to love Jesus, to know Jesus, to have a relationship with Jesus. Does that mission intimidate you? It should. But did God give you that mission? Yes, he did. Then God's provision is sufficient for that mission. Are you an employee? intimidated by the mission of reaching those you work with with the gospel? Did God give you that mission? Then God's provision is sufficient for that mission. Are you a teacher? 
intimidated by the task of living out your faith and speaking of Jesus in schools where it's really not legal to do so? Did God give you that mission? Then God's provision is sufficient for that mission. Are you a student studying in schools that ridicule Christianity and things of faith? Are you intimidated by trying to live as a Christian and speak of Jesus in your school? Did God give you that mission? God's provision is sufficient for that mission. Are you a Sunday school teacher or a group leader here in the church or in some uh, Christian organization and you have to teach about who Jesus is and what he has done? Does that mission intimidate you? Did God give you that mission? See, God's provision is sufficient for that mission. Are you a neighbor? Do you live in a neighborhood surrounded by people who don't know Jesus? Have you been sent to reach your neighbors? Yes, you have. Does that mission intimidate you? Well, God's provision is sufficient for that mission. Are you someone who are in a family with non-Christians, someone who volunteers in the community, someone who frequents the same coffee shop or gas station or grocery store, and you're starting to build relationships with those who work there? Are you someone who has been sent somewhere in some way to preach the gospel? Do you see what I'm getting at? Every single one of us have been sent on this mission to somebody. And I would guess that the majority of us are intimidated by that mission. And yet, as we have seen, God's provision is sufficient for whatever mission God has sent you on. We just need to be obedient. We need to be obedient and trust that God will provide what we need to succeed. I'm gonna invite the worship team up and those who are gonna serve communion to come down as I pray. We're going to spend some time reflecting on the good news of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ and him crucified. And we're going to do that by taking of these elements, of bread and juice that represent uh, the spilled blood and the broken body of Jesus. God, we thank you so much. Lord, that you have not given us a mission that you also did not equip us to accomplish. God, that we can trust you to provide what we need when we need it. And God, I, pr- I pray that we would have confidence in that, that we would not be intimidated, but we would faithfully proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ wherever we are sent, and that whatever it is that we lack or that we need, that you would provide. And may we, whether we see the results or not, may we trust that you are using what we say and how we live to save people, because you love them. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.